There we go. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Uh, good to uh, good to be here. Good to good to see you here. Already have several logged in. Awesome. Wonderful. <clears throat> um, I do pray that everyone is uh, safe and healthy and warm and uh, protected. I gotta figure out how to quiet things down. Ah, uh, I know what I need to do. I need to mute this one. I have too many things going on, I guess. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to try to do this to make sure that uh, we've got extra ways for people to join us, not just on Facebook, but also through Zoom. So I'm watching all that. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm the pastor here at Christ United Methodist Church in Waynesboro. And yes, once again today, I'm coming to you from the home office. Home office. Given the, I'm going to give the, the folks that do so much work um, for us, taking care of the roads. I'm giving them a little extra time to, uh, to get things cleared up, uh, make things a little safer for my journey in. And I, I pray that all of you are, are doing something similar, either staying home or at least just waiting that extra little bit before you head out this morning. We want everyone to be, to be as safe as possible. I want you to be able to join me again. Speaking of joining me, thank you for doing that. I'm glad that you're, uh, you're joining me this morning as we continue our journey through the book of Exodus, which we've just been getting started. Um, I like to make sure that you're able to stay connected and engaged with anything I do here in an online form, you know, worship on Sunday uh, and, and these daily Bible readings. Um, so uh, as some of you have already done, say hello. Not necessarily me, although that's fine, uh, but, to, but to everybody else as well. Say good morning, say hello, whatever. Uh, I see numbers of people that are on here, but it's nice to see a comment once in a while. So I know that it's not just a number, there's people and I know who it is. So good morning to all of you. Good morning to all of you. And uh, if you are uh, if you wanted to join us on Zoom, you could do that. Or if you know somebody who uh, might be interested in doing that because they don't have Facebook or they don't wanna use Facebook, um, they, could, they could do it that way. Oh, and uh, Cheryl's, Cheryl says hello uh, via, via Zoom. <laughs> uh, so good morning to all of you. Good morning to all of you. You can also use that stream if, uh, if you have a comment or a question. You, know, you can do it through the stream or you can text me or you can use chat on Zoom. Uh, so that means I'm trying to do several things at once. My wife will tell you that I'm not good at that. Um, so I'll do the best I can. If I miss your comments or questions, I'll try to get back to them later to make sure uh, to make sure that I get get you the information you want. So here we are on chapter two, chapter two of Exodus. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed chapter one and maybe learned something from it. Uh, and hope, hopefully you did because you're back. <laughs> wow. The number keeps going up. Um, also, if you know somebody that you think might benefit from uh, from seeing these videos, feel free to share the stream either before, either right now while it's live or after it's done. If you wanted to share that uh, on your page, you have my permission to do that. Um, any way that we can reach more people, right? Any way that we can reach more people, I'm happy with that. I'm more, more than happy to do something like that. So anyway, here we go. We're, we're on chapter, we're going to go to chapter two, right? Chapter one sets us up a little bit, introduces the, the bad guy, um, and, and we're going to go from there. And it's, it's telling right off the bat that it's sort of a story between life and, and death, between life and death. All right, so here we are, chapter two. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Mm -hmm. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. Pause. So uh, this is pretty quick, pretty quick happenings here. Uh, we've got a, uh, a man and a woman meet. They, uh, they fall in love. They have a kid. Uh, now, the mothers can tell that there's a special baby. She sees he's a special baby. Of course, what mother doesn't think their baby is special, right, in, in some way? 
but there's something about it. And we're, we're not 100% sure what the Hebrew means as far as special baby. Did she see that he was extra, uh, extra good looking? Um, did she just have this feeling uh, about something going on, about something going on with this child? And she tried to keep him hidden. She kept him hidden for three months, kept him hidden for three months. Because remember, um, if, if, if they found the child, supposed to be thrown into, into the Nile River, which, you know, the Nile is the source of life for, is, for Egypt. And, and yet this new king, unnamed king, wants to use it for death, wants to use it for death. But when she can no longer keep him hidden, maybe he was getting too loud, too noisy and, and stuff like that. Uh, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. The word that is translated basket is actually the same word used in Genesis to describe the ark of the flood, okay, uh, which was used to keep a remnant alive. And here it's an ark being used to keep, again, to keep an, a remnant alive, perhaps to keep this child alive. She put the baby in the basket, in the ark, and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. I'm going to pause again. I know it's right off the bat. I just paused two seconds ago, all right? But that word for reed, uh, in, in the, the Hebrew word that's translated reeds, uh, it, it's important. It's important. It's, it is the same word used later to describe part of the Exodus, uh, which traditional translations, you know, Old King James Version and the, the movie, The Ten Commandments with, uh, with Charlton Heston describes the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Red Sea is a bad translation. The word is reeds. It's the same word as here. So the fact that um, the, this woman, this mother, is placing her child in, a, in an ark, uh, a source of, of, uh, of sustaining life, a source of, 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 of getting through, uh, through a flood, and putting this child in the Nile River, the, a, a source of life, for Egypt and placing him in the reeds of this river of the sea uh, sort of presages or uh, you know it, it it alerts us that this, this child who we're going to find out in a moment is Moses um, is on this edge of deliverance and freedom before the rest of the Israelites are before the rest of the Israelites are so that's what the author of this section is kind of kind of saying here by saying, but using that same word, it's reed. Uh, she's placing them on the reeds and then the Israelites at some point will cross the reed sea. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river. Notice Pharaoh still doesn't have a name. And her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. To get it for her. Pause. So uh, if you ever saw, I don't know if you saw the movie in the, the, I think it was from the 90s, The Prince of Egypt. It was the animated version of, of this story, uh, which the mother puts Moses in the basket and sets him in the Nile River, and he goes this way and that way and over waters and gets bumped by crocodiles and stuff like that until he lands in, in, in the reeds. That's not the way the story goes here in, in, uh, in the Bible, in Exodus. Uh, she doesn't just cast him into the river. She sets him in a particular place. She sets him in a particular place. Now, why did she pick that place? It must have been a place uh, known to have been frequented by, I'm going to say, by Egyptians, perhaps in particular by this princess. If it was a place that would have only been uh, frequented by Hebrews, remember, you know, slaves or all the lower echelon, not just Israelites. Um, then the child, you know, the story wouldn't have gone so well. 
So perhaps this princess was known to go to this place and, and bathe there. Um, and, and so she, that's why she set this child there. And meanwhile, the sister is nearby, which we're going to find out. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Okay, so we're going to pause there. We're going to pause there for, because there's all kinds of stuff going on. So the, the princess, who also is not named, she the same as the, the, the Pharaoh. You know, if reading this story, hearing this story for the first time, you can only, I mean, you can imagine what might be, be happening, right? Oh, she finds a child. She knows that it's a, a Hebrew, one of the slave children. And, and she must immediately, she's got a choice. She has a choice. She's the king's daughter. She must know what the king's rule is. She must know what the king's edict is. That all these children are supposed to die. All these boys, anyway, are supposed to die. But she chooses to be a source of life rather than death. She goes against her own father's wishes, her own father's edict. I think that kind of demonstrates, too, how, uh, how mad the king was, right? The mad king, even, even his daughter, can, can see, uh, my, my dad's crazy. I cannot live with, with this. I cannot do what he's asking us to do. And so she uh, becomes, uh, oh, she, became a so she becomes a source of life for Moses rather than a source of death that her father wanted. Uh, and so when the baby is older, when the boy grows up, uh, mother brings him back, you know, probably at least a couple years old, uh, if not older, uh, at, at the very least weaned, um, no longer nursing, old enough to, probably old enough to, old enough to walk, old enough to eat real food, so to speak, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, because you know, a princess, a princess doesn't take care of their own child. <laughs> um, that was that was kind of the whole thing here that the mother said so the mother is taking care of of the child. Continuing, continuing. Now the story goes fast, doesn't it? The story goes fast. Moses keeps growing up. He's just a little child. He's back with the princess. Next we read, it's much later, many years later. Pause because there's and there's a reason for that because. The story really isn't about Moses. Moses is a character in the story, and, and he's an important character in the story. Don't get me wrong, but it's ultimately it is not Moses's story. It's not his biography, so it's it's not necessary for the authors to fill in all these kind of details and stuff like that. Many years lo later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people. Pause. Who, who is that? At this point, we're going to find out who Moses is going to identify with, because he could be, when it says his own people, it could mean the Egyptians, uh, who are the taskmasters, the slave masters, or it could mean the Hebrews, this low-class slaves, outcast people. Which is it? Which is it? the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. 
pause. So uh, Moses is going to identify with, uh, with the Hebrews, not necessarily with Israelites, but with the Hebrews, with this low class, the slaves, the people who were being, being abused, tortured, forced to work. He is going to identify with them over and against the Egyptians with whom he has, with whom he has been raised and, and, and grew and, and educated. But he is putting, he, he's showing his character. He's showing his character, not so much in the murder of an Egyptian, um, but he's showing his character as far as being concerned about this, this low class group of people and seeing them as real people uh, with, with whom he is able to identify. But, you know, he looks around, nobody's here. Okay, I'm going to kill this guy, bury him. Continue. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, <clears throat> he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Pause. Notice the difference in how he reacts, though, right? Continue. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who had started the fight. So pause. He doesn't go right in and, and like break it up and beat up on the guy. Uh, because in Hebrew, that was what happened when he, when, he, uh, when he killed the Egyptian. It was the same word that, that, uh, that they used to describe how the Egyptian slave masters were treating the slaves, how they were beating them. Um, so Moses treated the guy with the exact same um, treatment that he was giving to the slaves, only more of it because he beat him to death. But with seeing two Hebrews, two slaves, two outcast, low-class peoples uh, fighting with each other, he, he doesn't jump in in the same kind of way with, with the physicalness and, and beat up on the guy who started it. He, he speaks to them and, 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 and goes about it that way. And interjects, you guys are the same. You know, the other case yesterday was a case of a powerful person and an and an and a an not unpowerful, un unpowerful person, impowerful, whatever person, someone without power and someone with power. But today you're both without power, you're equals. Why are you doing this with each other? You should be you should be working together to to free yourselves. You should be working together against. The powerful. The man replied, who appointed you, our prince, to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened. And he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. Pause. So I'm going to, hopefully this is going to work. I'm going to try to show, share my screen because I got a little, I got a map for you. I got a map for you to show you kind of what it, what it all looks like. Uh, I think that's the one I want to share. Oops. Soon as this works properly and lets me get to the uh, right screen. There we go. There's map. There's the map of Egypt. All right. There's the map of Egypt. So um, those two, the places where <clears throat> Moses probably was, is up in this this region, this northern part of 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 Egypt, which, by the way, is referred to as Lower Egypt. If you when you're reading anything, uh, when, when you're reading, I, I think it says it in the Bible too, but uh, in particular, if you're reading any uh, history books or anything talking about this time period or, or uh, even more contemporarily, and it speaks of upper Egypt or lower Egypt, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to think of north as upper and south as, as lower. And typically that would be true especially when there's a river running through it. But there's something different about the Nile River, and you guys, folk, you folks probably already know this, the Nile flows from the south to the north. 
okay? It flows from the south to the north. And so therefore the southern section of Egypt is upper Egypt because it's the upper part of the river as opposed to downstream, which would be lower Egypt. So this is lower Egypt. And uh, those places where, he, where, uh, where all this has taken place is right up here in the north, right up here in the north. You know, Midian is way over here on this section. So Moses, Moses, uh, he, when it says he traveled through the desert and, you know, he, he ran away, he really ran away. Uh, you know, he, he didn't run, uh, he didn't run from Waynesboro to, to Greencastle. Okay. He, he, he ran from Waynesboro to, to Philadelphia uh, that, you know, he, he really traveled. He went really far to get away from Pharaoh because he was worried. He was concerned and you really can't blame him. So <clears throat> I just wanted to give you an idea uh, of, of what we're talking about. I also wanted to see if that would work and it did, yay. So we're probably gonna do some stuff like that in the future. Anyway, uh, so he went to this other place, Midian. He went to Midian, which would be uh, Arabic. <laughs> so when Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Wells are like town squares. It, it's where everybody goes. It's where everybody goes, okay? It's an important place. Uh, remember, we're talking desert, you know, very hot, very dry. The well is an important place. And especially if you're looking for, looking for shelter, protection, somebody to, uh, to kind of take you in and show you some hospitality, you go to the well. When you, if you go back and read Genesis, you'll see some multiple stories about things taking place at the well. We can also remember from the book of, uh, from the Gospel of John, Jesus meeting the woman at the well. The well is an important place. So when Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down at, beside a well. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. Pause. So, uh, we don't really know much about this priest of Midian. We don't know what that title means or what he was supposed to be doing. We're gonna find out his name in, in a minute, uh, or at least one of his names, because he's called a couple different things. Uh, he's called a couple different things. The fact that he's a priest isn't so important. That's why the, the author doesn't give us details as far as what does this mean, a priest of Midian, right? Uh, it's, it's almost more important that he's a father of seven daughters. He's a father of seven daughters. Now, it, and it says the, 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 his daughters went and it was their responsibility to get water. It was. It was the woman's responsibility at the time to get water. Um, and they got water and they were put in the troughs to, to water the animals. However, ooh, something's going to happen, right? Next, very next word, but we know something's going to happen. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. Pause. Um, I, I do like this translation. It says rescued. Um, your, your other translations might say something a little bit different. And it, it's, it's a very strong word in Hebrew. Um, rescued is pretty close. It's like delivered. It's saved. It, it's the same same root as the word salvation. Um, so <laughs> what Moses is doing is much stronger than just helping. Or, you know, it, it's not helping. It's way stronger than that. Moses is delivering these women from uh, from from the bad guys. Okay, when the girls return to Raoul, father's name, their father, he asked. Why are you back so soon today? Excuse me. <coughs> Why are you back so soon today? Typically, it took them a certain amount of time to get there. Perhaps they were used to being mistreated by the other shepherds, and it took extra long. And he's wondering, why did you guys get back so quick today? An, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Pause. So they were able to identify him as an Egyptian, which, which is interesting, probably because of his clothing. They knew he was a foreigner, uh, but must have been due to his clothing, his appearance in some way, shape, or form. They were able to identify him as 
a uh, as an, an Egyptian, as an Egyptian. But again, there's that word rescued, saved, delivered us. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked, why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Pause. The rule of hospitality uh, is, is essential among the ancient peoples in the, uh, in the, in the Middle Eastern area throughout Arabia and, and Israel and, and Egypt. Um, you, uh, if, you wanted to be, if you wanted to gain honor, you honored others and you were hospitable to others. Like I said, Moses went to the well. That's why you went to the well. You went for water and you went to try to meet people and find somebody who's going to be hospitable. So he's telling his daughters, why didn't you bring the guy back? Moses accepted the invitation and he settled there with them. In time, Raul gave Moses his daughter Sipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him, named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Pause. Wow. Things really happen, right? They're, they're developing quickly, um, or at least the author is skipping things to make it seem how fast everything is taking place. Moses didn't just stay for an afternoon for a meal, didn't just stay for a night or two. Mm -hmm. um, as he figured out where he was going to go next or what he was going to do, the little bit of hospitality that Raul uh, was offering became an, uh, an offer of an extended stay. Uh, and then the offer of a wife and the offer of a family. And so with his first child, Moses names, who, Moses names him Gershom, Gershom, which uh, in Hebrew, um, foreign or alien. Ger means alien um, and Sham is land. Um, so he is he realizes that he has been living uh, as a foreigner in a foreign land. He's been living as an alien um, in Egypt because he was living a life that didn't match who he really was and didn't match the people that he was able to identify with. And I should have mentioned uh, when Moses was named, when the princess named Moses, Moses itself really is, it's not an Israelite name. You know, it's not an Israelite name. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a Hebrew name. It was an Egyptian name. Um, and, and based on the time period, was, a, was a, a fairly popular name. You know, it's not like as popular as, as uh, John or Jim or something like that. But uh, it was a fairly popular name, but it was an Egyptian name. So uh, I should have pointed out because even down to his name, he was Egyptian. And yet he wasn't. And yet he wasn't. Okay. Uh, although Moses also sounds like a Hebrew word meaning draw out. You know, it doesn't really mean draw out. Moses itself doesn't mean draw out. But it sounds like a Hebrew word, an Israelite word, uh, meaning, uh, meaning draw out. Continuing the last couple of verses, woo -hoo, almost done with this chapter, right? And you're thinking, thank God. <laughs> Years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. End. So now, God is mentioned very briefly in chapter 1, but only in so much as uh, the, the, the two midwives, Pua and Shifra, were, feared God. And God blessed them uh, with the family. Um, but now, now, now God's ready to come into, I, I would say, come to center stage. God, God makes an appearance now in, in chapter two. So some things happen here. Yes, this mad king, unnamed mad king dies. So there's going to be, a, there's going to be a transition of power, right? which can be a shaky time period, especially when dealing with authoritarians and, and, and kings and queens and, and that kind of stuff. 
uh, it, it can be a very dangerous, it, it can be a, it can be a, it can be a time of, of, of upheaval, it can be a time of struggle, and it can be a time for the powerless to act. It can be a time for the powerless to, to finally say something, and that's what happens here. The, there's a verb or two used multiple times just in that passage. The people groaned. The people found their voice. The people groaned, okay, under their slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose to God. God heard their groaning and remembered and remembered. So it is at this time, it, the, the people of, yes, the, the Israelites, the Israelites themselves, not necessarily all the Hebrews, but the Israelites have found their voice. They've cried out to God and God remembered the promises that God had made to their ancestors. Not that God ever forgets, but God, uh, you know, it, it doesn't exactly mean the same thing that we, we think about that. So don't think that God forgot those promises. God didn't forget those promises. But God said, okay, it's time to act. It's time to act. Maybe because they found their voice. Maybe because they found their voice. All right, that's it for chapter two today. Um, once again, thank you so much. Ooh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. I, uh, I see you. Thank you. I appreciate your, your comments and stuff like that. That's great. I'm glad you find it worthwhile. Uh, so, folks. You know, be safe today. Oop, I see people going out to shovel and driveway and get to the mailbox. Please be careful out there. Make sure you're wearing some shoes, boots with uh, with good heels. Don't want people slipping and falling. I saw a video a friend posted. They they tried to walk out to their mailbox wearing a pair of Crocs. That didn't work very well. <laughs> um, and then to top it off, there was no mail in their mailbox. Why would you even think about going out in the middle of that storm yesterday to check for mail? Anyway, uh, so be safe. Like I said, I'm going to be heading in soon. Thanks to every time there is a reason. Yes, to every time there is a reason. Um, keep your eyes and ears, your spiritual eyes and ears open for God's action and love in, in your life and in the life of those around you. And when you see it, tell others about it. Tell others about it. Be blessed, my friends. Bye.